Most people would never guess this by looking at Australia's dry, sunburned landscape, but one of the country's most important water reserves is completely invisible. It sits underground. Quietly and methodically, Australia has been storing millions of gallons of treated salt water beneath the surface, and the results have fundamentally changed how the country survives drought. This is not a proposal or a future experiment. It is already in operation. And it explains why Australia, one of the driest inhabited continents on Earth, has avoided total water collapse while other regions with better rainfall continue to struggle. This story matters because it shows what happens when engineers plan for reality instead of hoping nature will cooperate. Australia's water problem did not arrive suddenly. It built up over decades, driven by geography, climate, and population growth. Australia is the flattest continent on Earth and one of the driest. Nearly 70% of its landmass is classified as arid or semi-arid. Rainfall is low, but the bigger issue is how unreliable it is. Some years deliver intense storms and flooding. Others deliver almost nothing. Long dry stretches are normal, not exceptional. This kind of variability makes traditional water planning extremely risky. For a long time, Australia relied heavily on surface water. Rivers, dams, and reservoirs were the backbone of supply. When it rained, dams filled. When it did not, levels dropped. That system worked when the climate was more stable and populations were smaller. But as cities grew and temperatures increased, the weaknesses became impossible to ignore. Open reservoirs lose water constantly through evaporation. During extreme heat waves, losses accelerate. In some inland regions, more water evaporates each year than rainfall replaces. The breaking point came during the millennium drought, which lasted from the late 1990s into the early 2010s. This was not a short dry spell. It was a prolonged stress test that exposed every flaw in the system. Reservoirs fell to historic lows. The Murray-Darling Basin, which supports a large share of Australia's agriculture, came under severe strain. Farmers faced water allocations so low that entire crops were abandoned. Cities imposed strict water restrictions that changed daily life. Car washing stopped. Lawns turned brown. Industries scaled back operations. At one point, some major cities were estimated to have less than two years of water left. That moment forced a shift in thinking. Engineers and policymakers accepted that waiting for rain was no longer a strategy. Climate models were pointing toward hotter conditions, longer droughts, and more extreme variability. Building bigger dams alone would not solve the problem. Bigger dams still sit under the sun. They still evaporate. They still depend on rainfall arriving at the right time. So Australia asked a different question. Instead of asking how to capture more water on the surface, the focus shifted to how to protect water once it was available. The answer was underground storage. From an engineering perspective, the logic is solid. Water stored underground is shielded from heat. It does not evaporate. It stays at stable temperatures year-round. It is protected from bushfires, algae growth, and surface contamination. Underground storage also spreads risk. Instead of relying on a few massive reservoirs, water can be stored across many aquifers beneath cities and regions. This led to the large-scale adoption of managed aquifer recharge. In simple terms, this means deliberately putting water back into underground aquifers after it has been treated. Aquifers are natural formations of sand, gravel, or porous rock that can hold and transmit water. Australia is fortunate to sit on vast groundwater systems, including the Great Artesian Basin, one of the largest aquifers on Earth. Historically, these systems were treated as extraction zones. Water was pumped out with little thought given to replenishment. That approach proved unsustainable. Overextraction lowered groundwater levels, dried up springs, and damaged ecosystems. The new approach focused on balance. Water could still be extracted, but it had to be replaced deliberately. Groundwater became a managed asset rather than an emergency backup. The next challenge was sourcing water for recharge. Australia did not rely on a single solution. Instead, it built redundancy. Three main sources feed the underground system, desalinated seawater, treated wastewater, and captured stormwater. 
Desalination became a cornerstone because Australia is surrounded by ocean. Seawater availability does not depend on rainfall. During drought, it remains constant. The challenge with desalination has always been energy and cost. Reverse osmosis requires pushing seawater through extremely fine membranes to remove salt and impurities. This process consumes significant electricity and demands advanced maintenance. Western Australia, particularly Perth, led the way. Repeated droughts made it clear that surface water alone could not support the city. Perth invested early and heavily in desalination. Today, nearly half of the city's drinking water comes from desalinated seawater. Large-scale plants operate continuously, producing hundreds of millions of liters per day. These plants are not emergency measures. They are permanent components of the water supply. Other states followed the same logic. Victoria built one of the largest desalination plants in the Southern Hemisphere. Its role is strategic. It does not need to run at full capacity all the time. Instead, it acts as insurance. When rainfall drops and reservoirs decline, production increases. When conditions improve, output can be reduced. This flexibility gives planners breathing room. A key point often missed is that desalinated water is not always sent directly to consumers. In many cases, it is injected underground into aquifers. This allows water to be stored without loss and recovered later when demand increases. From a systems perspective, this turns desalination into both a supply source and a storage tool. Wastewater recycling is the second major pillar. Australia stopped treating wastewater as a problem to dispose of and started treating it as a resource. Modern treatment plants use multiple stages of filtration, biological processing, and disinfection to clean wastewater to extremely high standards. The resulting water is suitable for industrial use, irrigation, and indirect potable supply. Cities like Perth and Adelaide use treated wastewater to recharge aquifers. Injection wells push the water underground where it mixes with existing groundwater. This process is carefully monitored to protect water quality. An added benefit is that it helps prevent saltwater intrusion in coastal aquifers, which is a growing problem in many parts of the world. Stormwater capture adds another layer of resilience. Australian cities increasingly use water-sensitive urban design. Instead of letting rain rush into drains and out to sea, systems are designed to slow it down. Permeable pavements, green spaces, detention basins, and infiltration zones allow rainwater to soak into the ground. This reduces flooding while replenishing aquifers naturally. All of these sources feed into a growing underground network. Moving water efficiently requires extensive pipeline systems. Australia has invested in thousands of kilometers of underground pipes that move water between treatment plants, recharge sites, reservoirs, and demand centers. Underground pipelines protect water from heat and contamination while maintaining stable pressure and temperature over long distances. Building this infrastructure has not been simple. Engineers have had to work through hard rock, unstable soils, and extreme heat. Construction schedules are often adjusted to protect workers during heat waves. Systems must withstand bushfires, floods, and decades of continuous operation. Reliability is not optional. Failure during drought is not acceptable. By the end of the millennium drought, Australia had fundamentally changed how it thought about water. Surface storage was no longer the only line of defense. Underground storage became central to national resilience. Water was no longer something to be captured and hoped for. It became something to be engineered, protected, and managed deliberately. This is only half the story. In the next part, we will look at how dams, environmental controls, renewable energy, and system integration turned this approach into a stable, long-term solution, and why other countries are now studying Australia's underground water strategy closely. By the time Australia emerged from the millennium drought, the country was no longer thinking about water as a single system built around rain and rivers. It was thinking in layers. Surface water, underground storage, manufactured supply, and environmental protection were now treated as one integrated network. This shift is what turned individual technologies into a resilient national strategy. Dams still matter in this system, but their role has changed. 
Australia has hundreds of dams designed to capture rainfall and floodwater during rare heavy rain events. Major reservoirs such as Warragamba, Hume, and Dartmouth store enormous volumes of water and remain critical for cities and agriculture. The difference is that dams are no longer treated as the final destination. When reservoirs fill during wet years, excess water does not simply spill away or sit exposed to evaporation. Increasingly, that water is diverted into underground storage where it can be preserved for the long term. From an engineering perspective, this is about loss reduction. Open reservoirs are vulnerable. Sun, wind, and heat strip water away every day. Underground storage avoids that entirely. Water stored in aquifers can sit for years with minimal loss, acting as a strategic reserve that smooths out the extremes between floods and droughts. This turns short periods of abundance into long-term security. Environmental control has been a constant concern, especially with desalination. Producing fresh water from seawater leaves behind concentrated brine. If handled poorly, this can damage marine ecosystems. Australian desalination plants address this through offshore diffusers that spread brine over large areas, reducing salinity impacts. Discharge zones are monitored continuously. If thresholds are exceeded, operations are adjusted. This is not left to chance. It is regulated engineering. Energy use is another critical issue. Desalination is power-hungry, and relying on fossil fuels would undermine climate goals and increase operating costs. Australia has responded by increasingly pairing desalination with renewable energy. Wind and solar are integrated into power supply contracts, especially in coastal regions where renewable potential is strong. This reduces emissions and stabilizes long-term costs. It also insulates water supply from energy price shocks. Groundwater protection is equally important. Managed aquifer recharge is not simply about injecting water and walking away. Aquifers are monitored constantly. Engineers track pressure levels, flow rates, salinity, and water chemistry. Extraction is carefully balanced with recharge to avoid overuse. In coastal areas, this balance is critical. Without recharge, freshwater aquifers can be invaded by seawater, permanently damaging water quality. Recharging aquifers pushes that boundary back, protecting future supply. Land management ties everything together. Australia has learned that engineering alone is not enough. Healthy landscapes play a major role in water security. Reforestation, soil restoration, and watershed protection increase the land's ability to absorb and retain water. Healthy soils act like sponges. They reduce runoff, limit erosion, and allow more water to reach groundwater systems naturally. This reduces pressure on treatment plants and storage infrastructure. Urban design has also evolved. Cities are no longer built to shed water as fast as possible. Water-sensitive urban design encourages infiltration, reuse, and local storage. Green corridors, retention basins, and permeable surfaces slow water down. This reduces flood damage while quietly feeding aquifers below. It is a low-visibility solution with high impact. The real strength of Australia's system lies in integration. Desalination plants provide reliable baseline supply. Wastewater recycling closes the loop. Stormwater capture reduces losses. Dams handle variability. Aquifers provide long-term storage. Pipelines connect everything. Water moves between surface and underground storage depending on conditions. During wet years, the system stores. During dry years, it releases. Nothing operates in isolation. This integrated approach has already proven itself. During more recent droughts, Australian cities did not come close to the crisis level seen during the millennium drought. Restrictions were lighter. Supplies remained stable. Agriculture had more predictability. Industry could plan instead of panic. The system bought time, and in water management, time is everything. What is especially important is that this strategy did not rely on perfect conditions or ideal behavior. It assumed heat, drought, and variability as constants. That is why it works. It was designed for stress, not comfort. Other countries are paying attention. Regions in the Middle East, North Africa, parts of the United States, and Southern Europe face similar pressures. 
Declining rainfall, rising temperatures, and growing populations are pushing surface water systems to their limits. Australia's underground water strategy is now studied as a practical blueprint. Not because it is cheap or simple, but because it is realistic. Australia did not choose underground storage because it sounded clever. It chose it because surface storage alone was failing. Underground water does not make headlines. It cannot be photographed easily. It does not feel dramatic, but it quietly supports millions of people every day. That is what good engineering looks like. In a country where rain cannot be trusted and heat never rests, Australia built a system that does not depend on hope. It depends on physics, planning, and discipline. Water is manufactured when needed, protected when available, and released when required. Losses are minimized. Risks are spread. Extremes are absorbed. This is why Australia has avoided the kind of water collapse many once predicted. Not because it rains more. Not because it is luckier. But because it stopped reacting to drought and started engineering around it. If this explanation helped you understand how water scarcity can actually be managed, share it with someone who thinks drought is unsolvable, and subscribe for more real-world engineering stories that explain how countries survive under pressure.